first step of the nutrition care process is assessment. And for this step, you're going to gather anthropometric, biochemical, clinical, and dietary data. For dietary data, you're going to need to measure dietary intake. We'll need to know the nutrient composition of those foods, and then we'll have to ha identify the specific food or nutrient standard that we want to compare it to. And this video is going to focus on those databases uh, with the nutrient composition of foods. And I find that this is often the most underappreciated aspect of completing a dietary assessment. So let's take a look. Here's our day's worth of food intake. And we could compare the food to the MyPlate, which is our food-based standard. But more often than not, we want to assess the nutrient intake. In other words, we don't want to just look at the amount of dairy, fruit, and vegetable in this diet, but we actually want to assess the amount of calcium, vitamin C, and vitamin A. So I've entered this food into a dietary analysis software program, and it's generated various reports. Here's a bar graph comparing the nutrient values to the RDAs. If we look at vitamin A specifically, it indicates that this one day's food intake, it meets 60% of the person's RDA for vitamin A. A nutrient spreadsheet can identify the amount of foods, of vitamin A in each food. If we look at the data more closely, we see that carrots are our biggest source, which is no surprise. Carrots are a great source of vitamin A. And we see small amounts in the salmon, green beans, and butter. There is zero coming from the oatmeal, beef, potatoes, and alcohol. But you will also notice these dashes. These are not the same as zero. Zero means the food contains no vitamin A, but a dash means the data is missing. Now, milk's a good source of vitamin A, so there is almost certainly a significant amount of vitamin A in this iced latte. Our initial assessment, then, that the individual is only consuming 60% of the RDA is almost certainly wrong. So it's important that we look at the nutrient values of the foods, look at those spreadsheets, and identify if there's any missing data that might be indicative of wrong total values. So we're going to take a look at those nutrient composition databases and identify which ones we might want to use, uh, what might be the limitations and appropriate one to use. Specifically, we're going to look at the USDA Nutrient Data Laboratory and their reference foods and the branded food products on their uh, websites. We'll look at a couple of commercially available food databases, My Diet Analysis and My Fitness Pal. And then we'll look at a, a macronutrient focused food database that's used in the healthcare system, um, the Food List for Diabetes, which is oftentimes called the Exchange System. So let's take a look at these. And the first food composition database we'll look at is the one here from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Notice that this website is designed around looking at one food at a time. It is not a website where I can enter in a day's worth of food or multiple days worth of food and compare it to a, a standard. It is just going to provide data, nutrient composition of one food at a time. And to look at it, I'm going to enter in peanut butter as a sample of how it it works. So I entered in peanut butter and noticed that it came up to over 6,700 foods. And, and so there's way too many foods that I, I've got to pick from. So I'm going to narrow that a little bit. And one way that is to take a look at the different databases. This is all databases, but if I click there, you'll see that I have two databases to pick from, the standard reference and the branded food products. This website, the USDA Food Composition Database, is a public-private partnership between USDA data laboratories and the food industry to collect data about foods. I'm going to click on the standard reference first. Standard reference, one of the things it does is reduces the number of food. We went from over 6,700 foods to 147, so the number of foods has really dropped dramatically. But we're going to, what we'll find is there are a lot more nutrients have been analyzed. In fact, the standard reference is coming from USDA analysis. And it is considered the gold standard because it does such more a breadth of nutrients to be analyzed. It uh, will analyze up to 150 different nutrient components. So I'm going to pick here peanut butter, chunky style, because that's the best kind, and with salt, because that's the most common style. And we'll get a report. This report has 32 nutrients that have been analyzed. And that's a basic report on peanut butter. I can scroll down and see the nutrients that are there. And notice that I can also change the portion to the uh, uh, maybe the amount that you consumed of that specific food. But there's no way to collect it and add it to anything to compare for a whole day. 
The other thing to notice here is that there is a full report. So I'm going to click on that full report for all nutrients that have been analyzed on this chunky peanut butter. And now notice that there's 109 nutrients that have been analyzed. And so I'll scroll through that and we can see just much more detailed about the specific type of carbohydrates, the specific vitamins, specific fats, and down, uh, down the list of different amino acids, not just total protein. So when the reference standards, it's USDA, not as many food, but many more nutrients are being analyzed. So let's go back and enter peanut butter into our search again. But this time we're going to select that branded food products and see what we have there. We have almost all of the foods are still in our search for peanut butter in the branded food. So most of the foods in the USDA website here is actually going to be from branded food products. This is coming from the food industry and there are a lot more foods, but it is going to be a much limited number of nutrients. So let's select one. I'm going to select High V, a local grocery store here. And if we look at their food report for the peanut butter from hy V. we only have one report. It's called the full report, but it is a much smaller report. This report only has 14 nutrients. Again, when they have the food industry entering the data, they only require that they put in those nutrients linked with the food label. What we're going to find then is that this USDA food composition database, and specifically the standard reference data, will be found in commercial food products. So let's take a look at how we see this data being put into commercial food uh, diet analysis software. So now I'm going to take a look at a couple of commercially available diet analysis software, starting with MyFitnessPal, a free online website where you can enter in your food and actually keep track of dietary intake. We're going to enter in the same food. We'll enter in peanut butter and see the data that is there. So they have peanut butter and notice that they have a little green check there. That green check means that they, MyFitnessPal, believes the food listing in its database has been complete and the nutrition information is, is accurate. And this is really kind of a crowdsourced database. If you look at the nutrition information, You'll see that it generally is at a food label uh, level of data, and then they have the number of people who confirm that the data is correct. So it's not like they have a, a, a nutrition data analysis like the USDA actually doing the analysis, but people just enter in the data from a food label. So we're going to see a lot of variety of foods, but not very many nutrients are going to be included. So that's my fitness pal and a lot of crowdsourcing and it probably does have a lot of USDA data, but it's not obvious that it's there. So now we'll look at my diet analysis, a commercially available software commonly used in nutrition classes. Again, we're focusing in on the nutrient data base, so I'm going to jump right to enter in a food. I'm going to enter in peanut butter again. And what you'll find here, you'll find a lot more information about that data. The first thing you'll notice is that the ones that pop up first will have the more generic and they'll actually indicate USDA. And that means it's coming from that USDA reference standard. So this would be a food, we can look at it, that will have much more details about that nutrient composition of that food because it's coming from that limited foods, but more details. So we'll add that. And I'm going to do another one. We'll do another peanut butter. And we'll do a more specific one and look at the nutrient content for that. And you're going to find that there's a lot of missing data here. We have those data, uh, data points for those nutrients on a food label, but it's missing those nutrients that are not required to be on a food label. Now at this point, you may assume that every time you go to select a food, the best option would be that with the USDA indicated there. But that's not accurate because it really depends on what nutrient that you're trying to assess. If you're looking at for those nutrients that are not typically found on a food label or you don't know exactly what a person consumed, then the USDA is going to be the best option. But if you know that you consumed GIF, reduced fat, crunchy peanut butter, and you're looking for nutrients that are typically on a food label, maybe carbohydrate, protein, and fat, then that's the one you should pick. So if we add that, we can know that that's actually going to be appropriate. And looking at the spreadsheet for it, take a look over here, get to the spreadsheet with just those peanut butter, we're going to find that it actually can be quite different. And we can see when we look at the spreadsheet 
that that peanut butter has much less fat and more carbohydrate than the generic version of the peanut butter. So determining which one you're going to pick depends on what's happening. If you don't know what the person consumed or you're looking for more specific nutrients, then pick USDA. But if you know exactly what the person consumed and you're looking for those major nutrients that are found on food labels, then that's the one you want to pick. The final database I will cover is titled Choose Your Foods, Food List for Diabetes. And although Choose Your Foods, Food List for Diabetes is its formal title, I will generally refer to it using its older and more common title, the Exchange System or the Exchange List. The Exchange System was originally developed in the 1950s by the American Diabetes Association and the American Dietetic Association, which is now called the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. It was developed to help individuals with diabetes mellitus regulate their carbohydrate intake. Today it's still used for that purpose, but anyone wanting to regulate their calories and or their macronutrient intake will find this system helpful. For example, athletes wanting to consume a specific amount of carbohydrates after a strenuous workout, or older, in, older individuals who have been advised to consume at least 20 grams of protein at each meal would find this system helpful. At first glance, the food list for diabetes with the exchange system looks like the MyPlate because it has fruits and vegetables and dairy and protein foods. But the exchange system organizes foods based upon their macronutrient content, meaning carbohydrate, protein, and fat, not their micronutrient content. Here are the food groups and the amount of carbohydrate, protein, and fat in one serving or one choice of each group. Because all foods in the portions listed have similar amounts of carbohydrate, protein, and fat, you can trade one for the other, or you can exchange them, so that's where it got its name. This allows for a variety of foods, but yet a consistent amount of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Let's use starch group as an example. Now this group includes foods that are rich in carbohydrates, rich in starch, and that would be breads, cereals, pastas, and foods like that. One serving or one choice of this group would provide 15 grams of carbohydrate, 3 grams of protein, and 1 gram of fat. The serving size is important, however, that we have that consistent amount of those macronutrients. For rice, it's a half a cup. For unsweetened cereals, it's 3 fourths a cup. But we could trade between those, one day a half a cup of rice, the next 3 fourths a cup of unsweetened cereals. The system can be used to quickly estimate the amount of carbohydrate, protein, and fat once you know what the portions are. But more often it's used to plan a diet to meet specific calorie and macronutrient levels. This requires first having a diet prescription, knowing how many calories and then the percent of carbohydrate, protein, and fat, how you'll distribute those calories. Then you're going to determine the diet plan where you convert the calories from each of those macronutrients to grams and then we're going to select the number of exchanges or choices with each group. And then finally you go and pick the foods. Uh, and we will go through those steps in class. But it's important for you to understand that this system, this choose your foods, the food list for diabetes, is not a food standard or a nutrient standard. It is a database that organizes foods based upon their carbohydrate, protein, and fatty content. More importantly, it's a database that you can memorize. Knowing micronutrient contents foods is almost beyond our abilities, so we need those diet analysis softwares with the accurate databases to do an assessment. But you can get to know this system well enough that you can assess the macronutrient intake with most common foods by using the system. So completing a dietary assessment has three key elements measuring intake and having a food or nutrient standard to compare it to are the two elements that most students remember. But it's that third element, the nutrient composition of foods and the databases that are used that is one that is often overlooked. So make sure you think about that piece. Is the database that you're using appropriate for the nutrient you're trying to assess? If you look at the values, don't just look at the totals. You need to make sure that you look up on the spreadsheets look for any missing data points or you're going to be underestimating the amount that someone's consumed. All three elements are going to be important for completing an accurate dietary assessment.